<laughs> Hello, everyone. Rest of Aquarimax here. I am having some technical difficulties, so please bear with me as we get things uh, set up. I was trying to stream. Uh, I, I set up the stream wrong in some fashion, and so I'm trying to get it to work now. Trying to stream, and as you can hear, I'm having some issues. So, welcome anyway. Hopefully, we'll get some people in here. I can see that there are two people watching, and I'm waiting, uh, hopefully, to get the uh, recording from, or sorry, to get the link up in some places. I usually put it up on Patreon first, and trying to get there. So, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to send the link out to Patreon so that people can see it, and trying to get there. And I apologize for the issues, but I, but I think I'm close. Um, I'm going to do it again here, posting that to Patreon. So just one second as I do that. And correct link here. Boom. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Now I see a lot of people here. Aqua Garden Zen, Frank the Tank, Jay's Crazy Obsession, Wendy Hickson, Cassie Settler, Acrocanthos Maxima, Sandy Sizemore, Young Lad, Ashley Neville, Sherry Edwards, Toilet Pete, and yeah, uh, I think that caught everybody so far, hopefully. And happy Thanksgiving to you, Sherry, and to everyone who is going to be celebrating it. I am. I'm, I'm excited for that. I'm going to spend some time with family, extended family, as well as immediate family, so that's cool. Um, let's see. Thank you to those of you who were able to show up yesterday to the stream with... Uh, Iso Buddies Productions and Wally at Supreme Gecko. That was that was fun. Uh, we had a we had a fun stream and pods giving feeding some isopods on live uh, YouTube stream while we were also talking about isopod feeding and nutrition. And today's topic is going to be a little different. Today's topic is going to be about um, basically the herpeticulture and invertebrates hobbies and what. Uh, how people would like to see them change. What would we improve about it? It's, it's always a good idea to just kind of take stock of where the hobby is and, and what kinds of things we can do to improve it. I think our live stream we did last week about UVB with uh, VivTech was kind of in the same vein um, because they were talking about, well, UVB, the way we perceive what it does, the way we understand ultraviolet radiation in general and how it affects animals, has a lot of room for improvement and they are taking great strides in making those improvements. So I think uh, that's awesome. And we want to, you know, look in all those directions. So it sounds like Frank Detank's preparing the turkey and Sandy Sizemore is cutting holes in bins. Excellent. Two very worthy activities to uh, accompany this particular stream. So basically what I did on Patreon, I posted these questions, but anybody is now welcome to, uh, you know, contribute their answers and ideas to these. I see some more people are in the stream too. We have Valerie and 503, Reptilia Exotics. Excellent. So thinking again, herpeticulture and invertebrates, what could the hobby use that it doesn't already have? That's the first question. So be thinking about this. Um, what could the hobby use that it doesn't already have? And this could apply to reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, whatever, including isopods, of course. So Jay's Crazy Obsession has a question. What the name of the isopods you suggest for living on my floating island in my fish tank? I'm thinking, I don't remember exactly what I suggested, but I would say Atlantosha Floridana might not be a bad choice. I'm not quite sure how they would do, but they do like most warm environments. So I would they do better than some others, which would just drown themselves. So it's worth a shot. Okay, I'm not sure how to say your name, Evangelist, but hello and welcome. Okay, so what could the hobby use that it doesn't already have? If you could create anything for the hobby, what would it be? What would be awesome in the future of herpeticulture? Where do you see the future of the hobby going? And what do we already have could be improved? So I've gotten some comments on Patreon. I'll be, I'll be uh, sharing those with you, but I also would like to hear what you have to say in addition to those comments. So... In the context of what can we improve that's in the hobby now, um, Ashley Nebel contributed shipping. Shipping could always be better. 
Agreed. I think shipping's made some great strides, uh, but there's a lot of room for improvement. And she has some uh, other details too. And I think someone else mentioned something about shipping as well that will tie into this. So we'll see how it goes. Um, says, I think it would be so cool to see isopod or other inverted enclosures you can custom design using 3D printing. I, I do think that's awesome. Um, and not just uh, enclosures, but enclosure furniture, decor, uh, things like hides and food dishes, or maybe a combined hide slash food dish and, and this kind of thing with uh, custom 3D printing. I know that uh, things like... Uh, mm, mushrooms that look like they are you know tropical mushrooms growing out of a piece of wood and things like that are being 3d printed um ray i know you you did some of those when we were in an expo a while back i got to see those that kind of thing is pretty cool and you can make it look pretty pretty realistic uh without being you know having the upkeep and stuff like that so um and 503 animal kits at big box pet stores that aren't awful agreed agreed uh the last time I bought one of those, I was, it was so frustrating. All I wanted was a vivarium with a tight-fitting screen lid. The only thing I could find was a vivarium with a tight-fitting screen lid intended for use with reptiles. They came with two heat lamps, a bunch of decor, all these different things, most of which I wasn't going to use with it. Maybe I'm hoping to reap some of it I used with in various ways, but... A lot of it I didn't use at all, haven't used it all yet. I'm hoping to repurpose most of it, but yeah. And it wasn't even that it was like terrible. There were some that were terrible and would not have done anything for what I had, but terrible in the sense that I didn't need to spend that much. I didn't want to spend that much and I didn't need what they were selling. I only wanted the, the bare bones of it. And it's super hard to get those in the pet stores these days. So good point. Um, okay. So back to Ashley's points, she said, I think it would be so cool to see, no, I said that. Now that COVID cases are in decline of vaccines on our eyes, I think there needs to be an isopod con. <laughs> an isopod con, that would be something. Can you imagine a reptile uh, expo style expo that's just isopods? And I imagine we'd still include some other things. I, there'd probably be some reptiles there and other invertebrates, but uh, one that's intended primarily for isopods, I think we could do that. That sounds awesome, actually. That would be really cool. Hmm. Like it. Um, okay. So Ashley also says, I would love a coffee table type book of beautiful pictures of isopods and field guides. Hmm. I love it. That, that's a really cool idea. Um, where the purpose is actually less about, and I, I'm sure you probably put some information in there, but less about information about the isopods and more about the actual photos get some good macro photography and some nice display set up and get the pictures done for the the field guide or for the coffee table type book and field guides would be great too quesadilla wizard said i would buy that in a heartbeat so strudies on etsy are 3d printed various sizes to be used for hides i'd like to know more about that i'm gonna have to check that out And Reptilia Exotics, good point. All of Exoterra's enclosures have pictures on them that have nothing to do with the proper care of the animal. Very often true. Oh, with round table style talks there for the isopod. Oh, yeah, yeah, for the isopod con. That'd be cool. So here's one from Aqua Garden Zen. Says, number one, a new and improved book on all species of pictures, info, care, locality, and available morphs, like a bird watcher's encyclopedia. So kind of on the the field guidey sort of end of things. That would be super cool. Um, we have, I know that uh, Oren McMonagall probably has the closest thing out right now um, in that he has a recent version of his isopod zoology book. And I'm sure it has more species than the 2019 version that I have. Is it 2019 or 2020? I don't remember. It's one of those two years that I have. Um, the new one I'm sure has more species. I'm sure it doesn't have all the species in the hobby because by the time you write it, more species have entered the hobby, but it's probably the closest thing there is. And I love his book, so I'm sure it's good. Let's see. Oh, it looks like uh, Aqua Garden Zen also does. Hey, Kevin, congratulations on the Bumblebee Millipede baby. That's awesome. Now you won't be able to stop them, which is the point, right? 
Okay, number two from from uh, Aqua Garden Zen says, a club in every state for all over hobbyists with hands-on learning and fellowship. Yes, yes. And hopefully in every major city in the state, because a lot of times what we've got is uh, we have one or two clubs in the state and probably meetings aren't super accessible to everybody. Of course, it helps that you can do remote uh, meetings to some degree, but that's also... It's not ideal. It's not as good as, as meeting in person. So number three for the future. This is question number three. Live animal drone delivery. <laughs> How would that be? It'd be a lot faster than what we're doing now. So as long as it works, it's it's got to be better, right? Number four. Wants to see more availability in specific mor morphs for all states. It says in of maybe availability of specific morphs for all states. Okay, I, I think that's what that says there. And then number five, what is needed to improve understanding of all species and care needs. Good points. And okay, before I go on, I'm going to... Uh, so, oh, Ashley, Ashley got Warren's second edition. Awesome, I need to get that. I need to get that book. Maybe that's what I should ask for for Christmas, huh? Mentis God, I like to know what each one's natural habitat is so I can help better mirror what they live in. Good point. And Acrocanthos. Um, yeah, our budgie we used to be interested in getting ice supplies. I don't think he ever got one, but he tried. And yeah, totally uh, can happen. Oh, no, you saw your first pseudoscorpion a few days ago. That is awesome. Where was it? Was it an indoor pseudoscorpion, outdoor? Okay, now we're going on to um, Emmy Ollier's uh, question, or Patreon responses to the questions on Patreon. It says, ever tried the app uh, Planta? I need that, but for herps and inverps, I haven't tried that app. But uh, there are plenty of apps that let me make a list of the animals I have, but none that also have a database of species, in, database of species info and recommended environments common issues, etc. There are definitely no resources that also track plants in an enclosure. Cool. So an app like that, um, I'll need to look up that app and see. I happen to know an app developer pretty well. He's my dad. So, hmm, interesting. That, that'd be, be something. He's also getting close to retirement, so maybe this would be a project he'd like to do on the side. Hmm. Jason P., and we were chatting about this uh, not too long ago, standards for variance naming in the isopod world. Yes. Oh, and he mentioned that we talked briefly about this. Um, yeah, just for example, Oreo crumbles is also known as cookies and cream. It's, it's Porcellionides prunosis. It's the same genetic stock uh, as far as I know, but cookies and cream and Oreo crumbles are both names that are used for the same one. And that's just one example of many uh, isopods that have non-standard names. And it would be really helpful if we had standard, standardized cultivar names for these morphs. Okay. Oh, Nathan, I like this idea of raising feeders in large naturalistic enclosures. That's cool. So Noah, maybe you'll have more pseudoscorpions show up in that terrarium. That would be something. Aqua Garden Zen finds pseudoscorpions under the bark of downed ponderosa pines. Yeah, tree bark, under tree bark, especially if it's a little damp. That's the way to do it. Kevin just got a male albino granite checkered garter. Oh, those are pretty from BHB Reptiles. Awesome. Congrats on that one. They're very cool looking. Okay, Kajin, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, says, in the hobby, I would really love better care and tracking of genetics, especially in reptiles. If there were more education on the subject, some people would less readily breed the problematic morphs that are always associated with neurological conditions. I'm assuming you're thinking of things like uh, uh, spider ball pythons and uh, things like that. I also wish information about the original habitat of inverts was more detailed and readily available. Some of the isopod and millipede species have no information about what their habitat is like, what makes them special beyond a vague tropical and such. Yeah, and not only that, I agree with you, Kajin, but I would also say many times there these names like tropical isopods, tropical orange isopods, a lot of times they're not even tropical. 
they, they'll just give them that name and uh, has nothing to do with anything. Uh, they just call them tropical because somebody felt like calling them at at some point. So yes, I agree. Good point. And Kajin also says, also needless to say, but we need more education about conservation and rare species that are being endangered by the hobby. Uh, true. I, I think there are some issues in the hobby and have been uh, with collection in cases where collection might not be the most sustainable, where um, collection may actually be very, very endangering to the species in question, things like that. So yes, um, good point. Have I ever kept crabs, Noah? Uh, I have kept hermit crabs and a few other species of crabs, a few species of hermit crab, at least three that I can think of, four, four species of hermit crab, which I know are not true crabs, but you know, in that vein. Um, have I ever kept true crabs? True crabs, not long term, but I have kept hermit crabs. So. Oh, theropod hunter. Interesting point. Armadillidium pictum prefer the moist side. Yeah, there are some armadillidium that do. It seems kind of rare, but that's one good thing about providing a gradient, isn't it? You find out what they like. Um, okay, Mackenzie Bowling says, this is sure to be an interesting and detailed discussion. I tried to keep my responses relatively concise, so I apologize if they seem vague due to that. So response to number one, a library, physical or online, with access to literature. So that would be a great thing to have in the hobby, yes. Um, meaning literature like scientific peer-reviewed journals, that kind of thing that uh, relate to the species we're keeping, that kind of thing. Um, I'm lucky uh, because working at a university, I have access to uh, a lot of scientific papers and um, can, can find stuff like that without uh, too much trouble, without a paywall for a lot of them, but not everybody can. And it would be nice if we could do more of that. Hmm. So let's see. Uh, Mackenzie says on number two about coming up with uh, something new for the hobby, uh, improving things. Let's see. Shipping could definitely be better, maybe dedicated hubs and carriers or chauffeurs for animals. And we're, we're getting close to that with things like um, Ship Your Reptiles and Reptiles Express. And what are the names of the other ones? The, ones I, the one I've used is Ship Your Reptiles. And there are a few of them out there. Uh, different ones for different countries. I know there's a different one for Canada than there is for the U.S. And, and stuff like that. But we're getting close, and those services are very helpful because they've already gone through the hoops and um, kind of done a lot of the homework and the legwork that we need done to be able to do these things, to be able to ship, and that helps. But if they were actually completely uh, a courier service that's just completely serving animals rather than it's a kind of a subservice that's connected through FedEx and that kind of thing. That would be cool too. Ooh, uh, let's see, next one. Expo protocols. This is number three from, from McKinsey. Rodent shows, for example, have protocols in place for displays, quarantine measures, et cetera. I think it would improve the experience for the animals, vendors, and attendees. Attendees of expos followed suit. And that's probably partly because the regulation for mammals is much more strict than it is for reptiles. And it should be because, you know, uh, mammals have higher metabolisms and, and there are things that they couldn't handle that reptiles can handle. Uh, so there's that. But at the same time, I'm sure some of those, uh, some protocols, more standardized, specific protocols, think, thinking of reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates in mind. So keeping the, the differences in mind and making some protocols would be a good idea. If that makes sense. And... Number four, I see a future involving passionate hobbyists continuing to specialize in certain species and husbandry aspects and refining them. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a good point. We need uh, some specialization to some degree. And, and when I say specialization, I'm sure you're thinking of this too, Mackenzie. Uh, it's okay to be interested in a wide variety of things, and it's, it's not a bad thing to keep a wide variety of things as long as you're, you're doing what you need to be doing for them, doing a good job your husbandry and so on. But it is good to have specialties within those things. Like uh, there are certain reptiles I keep. Uh, I don't keep 97 different types of reptiles. I keep how many species? One, two, three, four, five, like six or seven species of reptiles and that's it. But I hope um, that I'm providing good, uh, 
good care to them and kind of specializing a little bit in that area. With isopods, I keep, you know, how many species? I don't know. I have around 80 bins. And I'm not sure how many morphs and species, but I'm sure it's over, well over 50, 60, something like that. I don't know. Uh, at any rate, I do specialize somewhat in isopods, though. So something like that. I think that's kind of the direction you're going. Um, and I think that's very cool. And then number five from Mackenzie says, access to information. Social media is fantastic in this regard, and I've gained priceless information from groups, but the existence of said information in groups is up to the discretion of the hosts, which is unfortunate. True. And sometimes the uh, hosts can do ridiculous things that aren't particularly helpful for fostering a positive environment or things like that. So I see what you're saying. All right, let's check the chat a little bit more here. Um, so Ashley Nebel is saying, I want to specialize in Benicillo parvus and Cubaris marina in Borneo as far as isopods go. Excellent. Ashley sent me some Benicillo parvus. I really like them. They're very cool. And I can I can totally see that um, the Benicillo parvus are very, very cute and, and kind of unique. They look very cool. Even the wild types look super cool. And I'm interested in getting at some point you know, the oranges and the wild types and the I have the Dalmatians now, and they're very cool. And they are now um, approved for shipping through most of the U.S. They're on the approved list. Cubaris Marina are on the approved list, too. So um, I don't have a Cubaris Marina or a Borneo, and someday I need to get some Cubaris uh, Marina, at least, and uh, try that out because I haven't kept that species. But I think specialization is cool and, and useful, and, and you can get the different morphs and do all kinds of things with it if you want to. That's what's fun. Aqua Garden Zen, wish we could get locusts in the U.S. as feeders. They would be way better than crickets. You know, uh, I was talking to, who was it? Was it when I was talking to Ryan last week on the UVB uh, episode, our UVB live stream? He was talking about a couple of people who are now breeding uh, a locust or a lubber or something like that in the U.S. as feeders, has the permits to ship them. And um, hopefully that will spread a little bit more because that would be great. And Osman, hello and welcome. Um, okay. Guaranayin, I can never remember how to pronounce your name, but good to see you here. I would like to see more info on amphibians other than dart frogs. Because dart frogs, yeah, there's a lot of information on dart frogs in general, but frogs, toads, and newts don't seem to get much attention. We'd like to see more captive bred versus wild caught. Yes, definitely. Captive bred's the way to go. And we really don't get as much attention on some of the other taxa of dart frogs beyond the uh, dendrobantids. That's true. Dendrobantids. I have a hard time saying that sometimes. And we all want more updated info because we all ISO nerds. <laughs> yes. Yeah, more about captive breeding and sharing info about how to go about it rather than being secretive to keep your demand high. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I understand people wanting to you know, make a living, but at the same time, I think there are other ways to do it rather than just trying to hide everything. So yeah, to, to some extent, um, it's it's nice to be able to share that information. I agree. And Ashley Neville, let's see, let's, let me know when you're ready. I have Marina, Marina Orange, and we'll be getting an albino marina called Glacier and the wild type purpose. Awesome. Well, um, I will be updating my permits so that I can uh, keep those. But actually, I think you already have the permit to ship them. So I don't actually need it because if you have the permit, you can ship it to me with that. So we'll talk. That's cool. Um, let's see. <laughs> there, Pot Hunter, you gave your mother your Borneo culture because she loves anything to do with Borneo. That, that works. Yes, Kevin, good point. Standardized expo protocols for reptiles would help cut down on mites and other contagious diseases. Cool. Oh, so Ashley, so tell me. The difference between papaya marina and marina orange, how do they look visually? Is, is the marina papaya more pink? So Therapod Hunter, looking for information on siren care. So by siren, you're talking about the large aquatic salamander, the one with the vestigial legs. I'm sure that's what you're talking about. I don't know much about them other than they're a large aquatic salamander with vestigial legs, but uh, uh, that would be cool. Does anybody have sources for that? 
Let's see. And there's Ben. Welcome. Nathan says, Abronia Alliance is a good example of breeders working together and sharing knowledge. Now, Abronia, I know, uh, is the genus of the alligator lizards, like the Mexican alligator lizards, which are super cool. We have some in our local aquarium. Every time I go there, just I just kind of geek out with those. They're very cool looking lizards. So um, I'll have to look into that. That sounds kind of cool. Because I love it when you get a group of a community where everybody's happy to share stuff. That's what we need. Like, you know, we're trying to create here, too. So Ben has a question about feeding isopods. Bought two frozen mice. I'm thawing them out. Can I feed them to my Porcelli Levis milk bags? Depends on how many Porcelli Levis milk bags you have, but I do that. If I have uh, frozen mice that a snake doesn't want, which happens occasionally, you know, if I'll, I'll thaw 10 and my snakes only six or seven or something, uh, then I will feed them to my milk bags or my dairy cows and they're gone, but I have a lot of both of them. So uh, they eat every single last vestige of those mice. So yes, you can once they're thought out. But if you only have 12 milk bags, it's not going to work. But if you have 300 and you have like a, a pinky, you're, you're good. Okay. Oh, so Therapon Hunter, you found a site that sells them, but little to no information. No, that could be a, a warning sign then. I wonder if anybody really keeps them here. I don't I don't I haven't heard a lot about it. Hmm. Okay. So the marina orange are kind of unusual, not how you expect, and the papaya are almost pastel pink. I do remember seeing the papaya on Smugbug's site. And um, I was going to get some, I wanted to get some, but I didn't have a permit for them and they hadn't approved them yet at the time, I think. Or I, I wasn't aware that they had approved them yet, so I couldn't get them. But it sounds like now it would be no problem. And Eileen O'Donnell, welcome. Um, it's probably, it makes sense that you would get it mixed up because I, yesterday I was a guest on another uh, live stream, so that probably accounts for it. Okay, well, Ben, if you have a, a six-quart bin full, you can probably do a small, like a pinky or a fuzzy mouse. If you have a, like a 16-quart bin that's a packed full of porcelain that was no packs, you're good. You can do it. You can throw even an adult mouse in there and probably take care of it. Yeah, I don't even chop the pinkies when I throw the... Uh, well, sometimes I've done the chopped pinkies when my little garters don't eat them, but um, even whole, without even doing anything to them, they'll, they'll eat them fast. So, yep, yeah, you'll be good. Oh, that's true, Jason. I forgot about that. That might be part of the reason why there's not a lot of information out there because um, now it's illegal to ship most salamanders. <laughs> Pod pusher. <laughs> that would be a pretty funny name for an isopod store. So papaya are kind of a soft pink. Yeah. And you don't see a lot of pink isopods, so that's pretty cool. I'm liking this idea. Okay, now I'm going to jump back into Patreon and see where we are. Um, Kelly Blood says, if I could create anything for the hobby, it would be affordable large enclosures. I keep crested geckos, and the 18 by 18 by 24 is expensive when you have many. Good point. And I don't care for the tubs. Yeah, and tubs are a cheap option, but they're not the most attractive option for sure. And UVB lights that are low profile and affordable, like the long LED lights one can get for an aquarium or plants. Cool. I like that idea too. Um, I do like the, uh, and I'm planning on purchasing, haven't purchased yet, but planning on purchasing UVB from uh, VivTech for my uh, garter snakes and probably for our leopard gecko as well. They are low profile in that the bulb is very, very short and you can put it in a very, very short fixture. And even because it is so low temperature, you can actually dispense with a fixture and just put it in a ceramic, you know, socket and mount it in a way that uh, it can be with inside the enclosure without burn danger, which is fantastic. So in that sense, they're low profile and they're affordable in the fact that you can save money over the life of the bulb because they last four and a half years with no uh, appreciable degradation of the, the light quality. So um, I think we're... We're getting there with those, which is pretty cool. 
Um, let's see. Okay, so Kevin just got some lavas, all juvenile, so it's going to be a bit before I see any colony growth. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing about getting juveniles. It's good in that they tend to be pretty adaptable and pretty um, tough when it comes to shipping, and you're going to get a lot of life spent out of them. But yeah, there's, that's the downside. And Jaden Peterson, yes, captive bred species whenever possible. Yep, and I think um, if you are bound and determined to get some captive breeding going, uh, then that is a reason to, you know, get some wild caught animals. But in general, uh, captive bred species, like with the blue death fanning beetle, you know, project that I had, of course, there weren't any captive bred blue death fanning beetles available in the hobby. So I wanted to try to help change that. And so I got some wild caught blue death fanning beetles and produced captive bred ones and spread information on how to do it. Now lots of people are producing captive bred blue death fanning beetles. So um, I think in that kind of case, it's justified. But if you're not going to go that direction and try to make sure you, we are getting captive bred animals, then yep, you need to make sure that they're captive bred as much as possible. So Ashley, do you know the, the species name on these rosy isopod? These rosy isopods? I don't know if I've heard of these. And Aqua Gardens Inn, we need more reptile stores with more variety. Yes, we do. Hmm. Let's see. You know, most mm, shops these days, you can get a very limited, even in the big box stores, you can get uh, Powder Blues these days, at least in PetSmart from uh, Smugbug, which is kind of cool that she's working with uh, PetSmart that way. Uh, but a lot of the pet stores don't carry them at all. I have, I got my Punta Canas, my original Punta Canas from a uh, pet shop, which is kind of fun, but uh, most of them don't carry, carry them at all. Oh, I see that 503 just said the same thing that I said. Um, so Kevin, Tarantula Cribs does custom sizes of the acrylic? That's awesome. I didn't, I didn't realize that. I knew they did a lot of sizes. And Frank to Tank, tragedy with your blue death fanny beetle. Can we get a group like US Arc, but for isopods and other buggies? Hmm. That's a that's a good idea. Um we ought to put something together like that. Oh no. You lost your colony due to a neighbor's poison, like they sprayed their yard or something. Uh. Oh, Androniscus dentiger. Okay. Or the rosy isopods. Um, ben, I did see Smugbug's new Porcelia Expansus morph. I think it's called Autumnal Equinox, and it's an orange morph. It's so cool. Love it. So Androniscus dentiger, all of them are a magenta color. They're just really fast and hard to see. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So Ashley Nebel chimed in again, said, I have to agree with Kajin. Conservation is huge and more transparency where, all, transparency where all these little critters come from. Agreed. We need more of that in the hobby as well. And Sandy Sizemore, merciless killing of all fungus gnats. Well, yes, I agree. Um, Um, we do need fungus gnat elimination. And with the catchy, with the, the rove beetles and with uh, ribbon ribbon traps, I'm close. Um, not to 100% extermination, but to uh, very effective control. Uh, my wife, I asked her, said, how how you, do you think the fungus gnats are doing? I've told Sandy this. Um, she said, they're probably 90% better. So it's not like I don't ever see them. 
but it's much, much better than it used to be. And of course, new enclosures are a little worse until things settle down, but there you go. So Frank to Tank, a uh, neighbor hired an exterminator, had a window open in the room. I had the beetles, so the wind blew the poison in the room. See, that scares me to death, that people can use poisons that are so potent that you can have a neighbor uh, poison things inside your house. I mean, how scary is that? That's, that's terrible. I'm really lucky in that the neighbor to my, what is this, my neighbor to the east of me never uses pesticides on his grass or his trees or anything like me. He doesn't do that. And um, I'm on approximately half an acre. And so I have like a safe zone where I can collect leaves and stuff like that and not worry about it too much. And the city does not spray the trees in the front yard or anything. You go a little bit further uh, west toward the lake uh, and there are more wetlands and so on. The city comes through and basically fogs the trees to kill mosquitoes. And uh, I don't have to worry about that, fortunately. So, all right. Oh, you almost bought lavas from Smugbug. Well, Jason, I do have some lavas if you're um, still looking. I can't remember if you said up there somebody got some recently. Was that you? Um, we can talk. I, I could save you some if you want uh, for when I start shipping again. We could work that out. And Osman, my new mic, um, it's working pretty well. Today, because of where I'm recording, I have a couple of different recording locations and I had some technical difficulties. I'm recording with my USB mic, which is not the one that hooks into my iPad. But when I record with my iPad, I got a new uh, a cordless mic, which works well. Tested it out yesterday, works well. So on the next time I record with my iPad, I will be using it and I'm really excited because there's basically no latency and it. Uh, I'm not gonna trip over it. That's, that's great because I'm tired of tripping over things when I'm uh, you know, doing a live stream because I do it all the time. So thank you for asking, and it's doing well, and thank you for those of you who contributed. So Kevin Zay, uh, I think many new isopod morphs are really expensive at first, and then they go down because they're usually fairly straightforward to breed. But things like, uh, depends on their, you know, the rate, reproductive rate and so on. But yeah, they gen to generally tend to be expensive. I mean, they're not tens of thousands of dollars, but I've heard of certain isopods, like some of the crazy Marulanellas, that could be over $200 an isopod. Okay, so actually they're about the size of the purple dwarf, but not so rounded. I, I think I see what you're saying. And probably also more magenta than... The uh, purple dwarfs are purple. And Baker, hello. Want to put in a display enclosure? You know what's really fun is Armadillidium gestroy in a display enclosure. I have some in a display enclosure, and they're always out and about, especially when you feed them, but even when you don't, you can always see them. I think um, Clue Guy tends to be pretty shy in my experience, I haven't tried them in a clear display enclosure, but the, the gesture are everywhere. So Eileen says, notice lately my springtails within the isopod enclosure aren't doing as well as far as breeding. Um, could it be because of a low moisture ice pods out competing or something else? Uh, well, there's a couple of things going on there. Uh, it could be low moisture. It depends on which species of springtail you have in there. If you have something like Sanilla curvaceta, then um, they're less likely to be affected by that because uh, they can handle lower moisture, not no moisture, but lower moisture. But it, it, if uh, it is something like that, isopods, this is what I've noticed. As the isopod population grows, uh, isopods do tend to outcompete the springtails. And by switching out a big chunk of the substrate, like a third to a half of the substrate, and refreshing it, you can often uh, kind of counteract that to some degree if you do it often enough. But yeah, especially if the population gets really big, ice pods will outcompete it. And at that point, it's not usually as big of a deal because the ice pods are going to be eating anything that would have molded. They're going to be outcompeting mites. They're going to be outcompeting fungus gnats, basically, and anything else. So it's not as much of an issue. So 
if if in the life of your isopod enclosure, your isopods are thriving and in high numbers and your springtails are, are lower, it's um, probably just something like that. And good point, Kevin. Snakes can get wrapped up in cordless mics. <laughs> Very good point. Oh, I want to do some Mason Bee Hotels, Therapod Hunter. My uh, cousin, bee expert, uh, has told me how to make them, and I've picked up some supplies to do it, and I never got around with it. Super obsessed with springtails. Well, I certainly love having springtails around. I'm not sure that I would be qualify as super obsessed, but I, I recognize their value for sure. I would love to get some of those bioluminescent springtails someday. Oh, yeah, springtails definitely are reproducing faster than the isopods. Mine do. Mickey M, hello, welcome. Long time no see. Let's see. So, green spots curl tighter than arm, any armadillidium you have. That's interesting. There's clog nog. So aqua gardens and your jester are always under their cork bark. Really? And do you have them in a clear container? This is what I've noticed. If I keep them in a translucent container, whenever I open it, they hide. But if I keep them in a clear container, I don't know if they're getting used to it. Or it's just not the vibrations. You know, I'm not moving it, so it's not vibrating. They're all over. They're out and about all the time. So I think it has to do with the container type to some degree. There may be other things going on, too. Oh, yeah. With a mold allergy, you definitely need springtails around. So, Ashley, you've got the clue guy in a large acrylic enclosure, and there's you have so many. They're all over the place. That's awesome. So you see them during the day. And, and it does have to do with numbers, too. It is a numbers game, for sure. Like, uh, talked about that in a video before. When you have a small starter culture, your ice pods are going to be nothing like they are when you have 300 of them. How do you feel about putting dried lichen and mineral powders in substrate mixes? Well, that's a good question. I haven't ever really thought about putting dried lichen in. But mineral powders I do put in. Like uh, I put in ground calcium, things like that. So Shiv, hello. Good to have you here. Spring hills go nuts over toilet peats, lichen in the bins, dried bark and lichen. Cool. So Jason P has made mason bee houses, but they were never used. Hmm. Buy a culture as well for the first few years of using them. Makes sense. So um, Cassie, um, did I isolate my Paracai piebald? I haven't yet. Um, I, the last time I checked, it was just hiding somewhere. I didn't see it, but I've been, you know, poking in there to see how it's doing. Um, I was kind of hoping that a few more would pop up so that I could, because I, I would like to set up a separate container um, to get that trait isolated. And I did actually find that somebody, I think in Arizona, has isolated a strain. But uh, I would love to work with the ones descended from yours and, and get that isolated. I just haven't haven't done it yet because uh, there's that only that one and I, I'm thinking it might be better to just kind of let it grow out in there for a while and determine if it's male or female uh, let it mature and then maybe separate it with half a dozen of the others and see if I can get the trait going what is the easiest cubara species to care for I'm not an expert on cubaris but I think uh, panda kings are pretty easy um, the red tigers um, are easy for me I don't have very many species of cubaras so um, panda kings are supposed to be really easy. Um, and the yeah, marina, that would be a good one. Good example. So she have been trying to cross a Wulgari red and magic potion for a few months. Sadly, I saw a magic potion monkey in my bin. Yeah, it might take a while, but eventually you'll see some, hopefully, depending on how the trait works, you should see some gray ones how the traits work. You should see some gray ones eventually. It might take a while because, you know, the magic potions and the reds are both, they're going to be, unless you put them in when they're very tiny, they will have mated with uh, their own morph for a while. Trying to change the beetle into pupae, should I not have food in with them? We're talking about uh, Asbolus varicosis. 
You can have food in with those, but if that's not what you're talking about, we have to look for something else. Okay, so yeah, the gestry hiding. I was just saying when I keep them in uh, display containers, they don't hide. When I keep them in a bin, they do. Oh, okay. Um, Cassie, totally. I'll take some pie bald if if you uh, let's set it up. Let's get it going. I would I would love to do that. Um, I will give I will dedicate a bin to them, and we can see if we can get that going. If if you don't mind, I would be I would be so so excited to do that. Um, so Ashley says. Just Troy, Clue Guy, Vulgari, and Zebras all like heights. So I had a branches and I see them all a lot more. The bins I have are quite tall. Good point. Um, Flavo Marginatus is another one that likes height. Uh, I have my Flavo Marginatus in a tall, clear display container and I see them all climbing a lot. So, very good point. And there's some other species like that too. So 503, my experience with the Panda King so far has been that they are super secretive. I agree. So I don't even know if I have babies or not. I've had them a few months, but I haven't seen a whole lot. Oh, so Clognog, yes, the desert beetle, like it's the it's an Eliodes armata. So I'm not sure with those. I just go ahead and keep food with them uh, myself, unless you find that it doesn't work for you. Okay, Cassie, let's 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 do it. That sounds good. Sounds really good. So, just Roy, um, the darkness uh, behind the light, the yellow spots, it does vary because some of them have white skirts, and I think in at least some of the populations, it seems to be the females that have the white skirts. Sometimes it's not entirely white; it's just a pale skirt, and some of them don't have that. Uh, I believe it's the females. I have to double check on that. But uh, I don't think there's a lot of variation so far. There's a variation in the size of the spots and the shape of the spots a little bit. There's even a, a variation out there that has white spots instead of yellow. So kind of cool. All right. So let's. we have some other comments here from Sandy. Sandy Sizemore says, in addition to merciless killing of all fungus gnats, like to see free classes at expos, informing newbies and advanced keepers both. Cool. That's kind of what we're working on with the local expo. Uh, they're trying to do a more uh, education-focused uh, efforts there, and that's part of the reason why they invited me to come to the expo uh, and do some educational things. And uh, that's they've invited others, too. We had... I think at least three groups when I was there um, in October. Clint's Reptiles was there. I was there. And I think Scales and Tails, our local Scales and Tails, was there doing some kind of uh, educational you know, uh, presentation. So I think that helps. And Sandy says, I'd love to be able to take online courses for keepers and breeders. Yeah. Yeah, also. Also a great point. So... More collaborations, less solo work, teaching husbandry on YouTube and such. I enjoyed pods giving. Well, excellent. Yeah, I love collaborations. As those of you who have watched my channel know, um, it's so, so uh, rewarding to, to collaborate with others. I love it. And again, the imminent death of all fungus nets. I see a pattern here, and I agree. <laughs> Not a fan of fungus nets. There is a... Keeper Jade Scorpion Bugs on uh, Instagram, I think, who keeps like wild numbers of some kind of pseudoscorpion in with isopods. And there are no fungus nets in these enclosures with these pseudoscorpions. It's in Europe where this is happening. But I'm hoping at some point we can get some of those pseudoscorpions over here uh, with some more testing, of course, and see how it goes. But apparently, there's no negative effect on the isopods. But there is a very negative effect on mites and fungus nets. So, some promising information there. Okay. Well, I think got through all the Patreon, Patreon questions here, I believe. Yeah, it looks like it. 
I'm just double checking here. I don't see any others. Great. And yeah, thank you to those of you who came to Pods Giving. That was it was fun to talk with Johannes or Josh, whatever you want to call him, and uh, with Wally, and just watch the ice pods eat and talk about ice pod food and all kinds of things. And just it was really cool. Yeah, fungus nets are just not the greatest news, are they? I do think the rove beetles are helping a lot, as well as you know the other things like the catchy. I, I think that's going to be a thing. Uh, we should get more rove beetles into the hobby, I think. And I don't think it's doesn't seem to be damaging my springtails at all or my ice pods at all. So I think it's working. And I've had them for quite a few months now. The rove beetles, uh, I hardly ever see them, but they do seem to be doing a number on the, the fungus nets. <laughs> what happens at Podsgiving stays at Podsgiving. Okay. Um, so, Baker, um, I don't think there is a better option than ivory millipedes for a display enclosure because they're one of the most surface active millipedes you can possibly get, and they're incredibly beautiful. Um, another similar size, though, that I will say an isopod, I, I mean, a millipede I love just as much as ivories is the, the flame lake. When they're adults, they tend to be up on the surface. They're about the same size as ivories, maybe a little slenderer, but approximately the same size. And they are gorgeous millipedes. The very first millipedes I ever kept, flame lakes. Uh, I absolutely love them. So Jason P., you haven't found the mosquito bits being helpful, huh? Is it Ashley... Ashley Nebel, have you have you found the uh, the mosquito bits to be working for you? And are you adding them dry? Are you making a, a tea of them? What are you doing with them, Jason? So yeah, fungus nets aren't a fruit fly, but they look kind of similar to them. They're thinner than fruit flies. They're a black color, uh, and they tend to be attracted to the kind of substrates we use with things like ice pods and millipedes. They, in fact, will eat. Uh, they don't, they're not attracted to isoprod frass per se, but they are attracted to millipede frass. So that's not great when you're keeping millipedes. I think, uh, oh, cool. Yeah, it's like 503 Menagerie says the ivory millipedes are always out in exploring. I just, I love that about them. Cool. And Purple variant ivories, yeah. Yeah, those are cool. All all ivories are just fantastic. I need to get some more. I had them for quite a while, and they were breeding for me and everything. But uh, I sold quite a few of them. But my population eventually crashed, and I think it might have been experiments I was doing with mosquito bits, but I can't be sure. Well, I have got to log off here in about three minutes. So does anybody have anything else to add? Um, once again, thank you for joining. I appreciate everybody and all of your uh, participation this uh, in this stream and it just in general. It's awesome. I, I love the community we have. And uh, I love how everybody's willing to help and provide information. It's beautiful. So 503 says, fungus nets are also attracted to coffee cups. I've consumed more of them than I like to think about. Yeah, and the fact that they just fly right up your nose if they can. Oh, I see what you're saying, Jason. Barium substrate didn't want to get them in contact with the isopods. Yeah. One study I read said um, a liquid of the Bacillus thuringiensis, which is the same stuff, sprayed on the isopods directly could harm them and did kill some. And what I tried to do is I'd make a tea and then pour it, but not on the isopods. Just pour it into the substrate. And that seemed, well, I did that with millipedes, not, not isopods. Whoa, 40-ish fungus nets flew in as you were stirring. At least it's extra protein for the for the geckos. So Ashley has no fungus nets at all. And how long have you been doing the uh, the uh, mosquito bits? Because 
We want to see the long-term effects. And I know it's been a long time that you've been keeping ice pods and using this, this mosquito bits and you have no fungus nets at all. This could be really useful for people. So how long has it been? And Baker, I would say that's big enough. And thank you, Osman. Thank you, Christina. And yeah, thank you, all of you. Doc Gordon's in and 503, Frank to Tank, Jason P, everybody. I, I, I'll probably miss a name if I try to go through everybody, but appreciate it, all of it. And I want to see, um, let's see. Oh, Eileen said about fungus gnats. They cannot be seen from Zoom video calls when they suddenly fly into your face while at work on a work call. Co workers just think you're crazy. <laughs> all right. Well, maybe, Ashley, what we need to do if you're still here, is do an interview about fungus gnats and mosquito bites and how it's worked for you. Um, so you lost some powders when you were using a squirt bottle, but not since you added it to substrate. So yeah, if you're ever interested in that, actually, let's let's think about that, doing an interview just about your experience with that and how you have applied it. All right, everyone, thank you so much. And I hope those of you who are celebrating Thanksgiving have a wonderful one, as I hope I will too. So thank you, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay tuned for my video on Friday.